First, I'll tell about the robbery our parents committed, then about the murders, which happened later. The robbery is the more important part, since it served to set my and my sister's lives on the courses they eventually followed. Nothing would make complete sense without that being told first. Our parents were the least likely two people in the world to rob a bank. They weren't strange people, not obviously criminals. No one would have thought they were destined to end up the way they did. They were just regular, although, of course, that kind of thinking became null and void the moment they did rob a bank. I, I always have liked beginnings that were grabbers. I always liked beginnings that would um, you know, throw down the gauntlet for the reader. The only problem with a beginning like that is that then you have got to have a second act. And sometimes if you don't have a second act, if you can't follow up a, a really good beginning like that with something equally gripping, then you might as well not have it because you've just basically created a trap for yourself and sprung it. So, no, I, I just, um, I always, I think when I wrote it, I knew it was okay. I thought it was just a sort of a typical old-fashioned narrative hook. And, you know, there, you're going to have a murder down the line here. You're going to have a bank being robbed, so, and by my parents. So I thought it was good. It's an American family of four people, two children, twin boy, girl, mother, father. And the father has been in the Air Force since World War II. And the, book takes place in 1960. Eventually, after staying in the Air Force, he gets out of the Air Force and then doesn't really know what to do with himself. He's been in the military his whole life. And they live in a little town of Great Falls, Montana, where neither of, none of them has ever lived before. And uh, he just happened to be stationed there in the Air Force. And he hatches upon a scheme to sell stolen beef to the railroad to sell to the dining car customers on the railroad. And he very quickly uh, come, runs amiss and runs afoul of the Indians who he basically goes into business with to kill the beef and deliver it to him. And he finds that he owes them $2,000, which is in 1960, a considerable sum of money for half a beef that is somehow or another gone rancid before they could sell it. And so in a, in, a, in, a, in a fit of sort of chaotic lunacy, rather than just leaving town in the middle of night or borrowing the money because he had no contacts in the town, no, no, no collateral, he didn't own anything, he determines he will rob a bank and get the money that way. And that sets in motion the book, actually. And, and what happens to him and his wife, who is his colleague in this bank robbery, is that they're immediately caught. And once they are immediately caught, then the children are left alone and the children fend for themselves. I mean, I invented that, so I, I don't really know what relation it bears to most people's normal thinking. I did discover when I was trying to make plausible to myself the idea that the two people who didn't have to rob a bank would rob a bank, that anybody who robs a bank who's not already a hardened criminal, who's not John Dillinger or Pretty Boy Floyd, anybody in a normal person who robs a bank is crazy because they're going to get caught immediately. So all, all, manner of, all manner of assumptions about how you do it and how you get away with it and what happens to you afterwards are complete lunacy because none of those things is going to be true because as, as, as Dell says, when, and I don't mean to quote my own book as though Dell was a creature I didn't write, but he says, when, when you think you're going to get away with robbing a bank, you forget one thing, and that is that you're the only person in town who's robbed a bank. And so you're going to stand out no matter what. Somehow or another, you're not going to be. You've given up your hold on normal. Yeah. For some reason or another, that was very vivid to me, that you will have the discretion of all of your normal life up to a point. And it's, I, think, I think Dell describes it as being on a boat which is getting farther and farther away from shore, or you're in a lighter than air balloon that rises higher and higher very quickly away from the surface of the earth. For a long time, you could just let go and be there. Or for a long time, you could swim back to shore and be safe. But all at once, imperceptibly, you can't anymore. And then your life is totally not a life you ever understood. Uh, in, the, in the first book, I'm just thinking about this, in the first book I ever wrote, 
there is an image which I just collected out of the culture about putting a frog into a pan of water at room temperature and little by little by little by little heating the water up. And the frog is sitting there perfectly fine and all of a sudden he's not perfectly fine and all of a sudden he's no longer viable. And that's, there's something about that odd change from what is totally normal to what is totally aberrant and felonious that it, it appeals to me. Maybe that's just one of the strange perversities in, involved in being a novelist. I don't know. I don't know. You know, Thoreau says that a, a writer is a man who, having nothing to do, finds something to do. I think it's all about being loved. I mean, uh, I've ne I've, as a child, I was loved. And one of the things that my wife always s says to me, she said, you know, I grew up in a, in a household of divorce. And she said, love was always conditional. She says, in re regarding me, she says, with you, love is unconditional. Because I love her unconditionally. And that's because I, I just think that that's the way life should be. And I'm far from perfect. But on, on that one issue, I, I, I do understand that, that, that to create a sense of reliable normality, that the person who loves you, loves you, and will always love you, is your due in life. And again, I'm speculating about a book that I wrote, okay? So there's a certain fatuity to that. But I think that's because the, those two children, his, Del and his sister, were loved as children. That, that they were most impressionably persuaded that normal was normal. That life had its normal parameters around it. And that no amount of eccentricity and no amount of shocking behavior by their parents quite disturbed that sense of normal so that they were pitched off, at least in Dell's case. His sister may be differently, so that they were pitched off into the chaos that, that no normalcy would describe. I always say that if the devil always was in your life wearing a red suit with a tail and horns, you wouldn't get anywhere close to him. But the fact of the matter is, the devil often comes with certain appeals. And it's also true just in dramatic terms that that drama is interesting when the villain says something that's true. So to create a persuasive villain, to create somebody who has the power that evil must have, because if evil was just dispensable, none of us would run afoul of it. But to create a, a, a character who has a sort of a tempting evil to him, he has to be able to make sense. He has to be able to have affection. He can't just be the antithesis of all that's good. He has to be tinctured by something that's appealing. Maybe none of us is a character at all. Um, I mean, I don't believe in character anyway. I don't believe that any of us has a sort of a kernel, hard, essential core that we are basically as human beings and certainly as literary creations. We are a combination of imputed memory, wishes and will, fears, desires, all kinds of things that just kind of get laid on, laid on, laid on, and laid on, and that because that is that's such a vertiginous kind of human condition, we ascribe to people to have cores to make that vertiginous seem less scary. So Dell is that way, uh, but one of the things that he does to establish his own sense of persuasiveness to himself is that he tells this story, and his ability to intercalate um, good with bad, violent with normal, love with not love, is a, is a measure of his gaining dominion over it. And to the extent that he can gain dominion over it, then he once more performs an act which would con conclude that he had a character. I, mean, I think we don't. It's, a kind of, it's not a heretical idea. It's, 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 it may be a slightly nihilistic idea. Growing up in the South was lucky in one way because I grew up down the street from Eudora Welty and not far from William Faulkner and, and, and the idea that being a writer 
was a possibility, was ingrained in everybody. Writing literature was just in the air in Mississippi. That was probably the only good thing about Mississippi. And everything else was bigoted and racially tense and unfair and absurd. And it made most of us who were white kids growing up in Mississippi basically kind of absurd creatures. So what I wanted to do to escape that sense of burden, a burden visited on me simply by the accident of my birth, was to get away. And one of the things I found out when I got away was that the South had been perpetrating a great lie upon me, many lies, actually. But one big lie was that the South was unique, that the South was, in fact, a very special place in the middle of an otherwise nondescript bland country, which was America. And what I found was that America was equally interesting irrespective of where you went, and that, and that the values, if, they, if you had particularly good values, which is to say that you didn't want to harm other people, that you didn't want to be prejudiced against other races, that you wanted to treat people equally, that, if, that, that, that those, kinds of, those kinds of mores and values worked everywhere, that the language in America was English, that the currency was the dollar, that the president was the president. So America was a much more, for me, approachable, and I, I won't say it was homogenous, because it really isn't homogenous, at least not superficially, but America was a much more approachable, knowable place, even for a Southerner, than I had been led to believe it was. You know, you sort of think Southerners only know the South. Southern writers only write about the South. Southern writers only write for other Southerners. What Southern writers know, only other Southerners can know. All baloney. It's all bullshit. It's complete bullshit. So I just decided to dedicate my life to proving that that was bullshit. It was worth doing because those preoccupations and those presumptions and those lies were very confining. Intellectually confining, morally confining, spatially confining, all those things you don't really need in a country as vast as ours. You want a country as vast as ours. You want to go. You want to see. Canada is, is, is hugely appealing to me for a lot of reasons. One is I always feel better when I go there. And I'm not quite sure why. I feel restored. I feel I'm in a more tolerant place. But there's also something about Canada which is mysterious, and that is that it is retinally uh, similar to America. But that once you pass across the 49th parallel and into Canada, you realize that you are in a totally different place from where you were before. And that combination of retinal similarity and profound difference is to me mystifying and interesting. And I, and I can't explain it. The book, this book is not about explaining that. But it is about putting that fact in play and seeing what can be said on the strength of that peculiar kind of nexus. Similarity encased in mystery. Mystery encased in similarity. You don't need a book to go out there and feel what it feels like and smell the surf. I just appropriate the language of the place. And from the language of the place, which is chiefly what I'm interested in, I kind of use, I sort of co-opt the reader to, in his or her minds, I envision the place where these words are appropriate. So Saskatchewan. I would want to write about Saskatchewan only so that I could put the word Saskatchewan on the page as many times as possible, because uh, I think that's exciting. But when I put it on the page, then that gives me an opportunity to to use other language to create descriptions and create word pictures, which will help make more plausible what the characters are doing in the foreground. So it's a kind of a, you know, one thing, on the one hand, it's just language, it's just words. On the other hand, that once you have the words, well, hell, you might as well describe what those words mean to most people's experience. And then you do that, again, so that you can make what the characters do be plausible. And chiefly, I think, for me, the language is pleasurable to a reader. I mean, a reader finds it pleasurable to read a description and think she or he can identify that out of life. But they also take pleasure in the fact of seeing that it's made up of all of these words which can be put together in such a felicitous way as to become almost but not quite invisible. So the complexity of that kind of dual medium experience is very pleasurable for a reader. And it's something that we all, as 
people who live on the earth are, are better if we know. We're better if we know. We're, we're better if we know that we look out a window and we see the surf, but that we also see the window. We also see the droplets on the window. Um, it's, in a, it's in an attempt to make lived experience be more valuable, to be more morally good, and to be alert to it. I have changed as a reader because when I was young, I didn't know what the hell I was reading. I was just reading books that I was taking on faith that people said were great books, such as Absalom, Absalom, for instance. I just, I just dived into books like diving into the surf, and whatever stuck to me stuck to me without my sense of knowing necessarily what that good stuff would be. Now I think I'm much more discerning as a reader uh, so that I know what the good stuff is when it's happening to me. But I, I couldn't have done that without that act of faith, which is to dive in without a clue. I mean, I mean, I was reading, a, I was reading the beginning of Oren Pamuk's book about Istanbul uh, yesterday, and, 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 and he, just, he just starts it off profoundly. You would think that he would give himself a little grace note or two, but he starts it off pro profoundly, and uh, I just thought, wow, wow, that's, and I sat down and I put the book down and I wrote about five pages in, in my notebook because it immediately triggered something in me that had not been, I had not been able to trigger in my own brain for 20 years. So, uh, so I, I know when I'm being acted on. And I think that's another thing that I know that I maybe wouldn't have known when I was young. That books act on you. And that books are fabrications. And that readers know they're being acted on. And, and readers like being acted on if they can feel like they're being acted on to great profit. It isn't as though a book has to become invisible or that its machinations and its uh, allures have to be uh, subliminal. They can be, they can be, and I learned this from writing in like Borges and the, the, the Latin Americans, Re readers are perfectly willing to be overtly acted on as long as they can feel like it's in some good, some good behalf. And I, I know that in my own work and I know that in my reading. My definition of literature comes from F.R. Levis, which is that literature is the supreme means by which we renew our sensuous and emotional life and by that means learn a new awareness. So I'm always reading to learn a new awareness. I'm always reading to have my sensuous and emotional life renewed. So that's very crucial to me because, um, well, when I was a young boy, life was not enough. I had to go to some other place to make life be enough. But the other thing, the other side of that duality, that dichotomous sense, is that, is that literature is made by regular people. Literature is made by Eudora Welty living in her house on Pinehurst Street and thinking her daily thoughts and suddenly realizing she has something she can write down. It's, you know, the, 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 as Picasso said, you know, all artists, art is local. And by that, he didn't mean just that it took place in somebody's village. He meant that it, was, it took place in someone's local heart with, with, with simple thoughts and simple expectations and simple perceptions. And out of those simple perceptions through the very hot Olympic that is a work of art becomes something st staggeringly wonderful. And that, to me, is irresistible about art, that it starts small. You know, I just backed into being a writer. I had failed at everything else. I'd been in the Marine Corps. I'd been to law school. I'd failed at staying in the South. I'd taught, a, I taught school a year and hadn't liked it. Nothing I had tried had opened a path for me that was followable. So I was just sitting around my mother's house one day in Little Rock, Arkansas, January 1968, and she looked at me with a very I was thinking about the, the scream, the monk painting, you know. She said to me, Richard, what are you going to do with yourself, son? And I said, for reasons that I could probably not replicate, I said, I think I'm going to try to be a writer. She just looked at me, because she, she actually read books. I think she thought, I'd never heard of such a thing in my life. But I don't know why I said it. If I had said something else, I would have probably done something else. But it just so happened fortuitously that I said, I'm going to try to be a writer. If I said, I'm going to go work for a bank, 
she would have been happy. But I didn't say that. You know, why, you know, I, that, that interests me that you, you think about a man like me who's had a life as a writer for 40 plus years. Started out really with just a random remark that I made to my mother on a cold January day in 1968. You know, there was not a drum roll. Trumpets didn't play. And then when I said within a week to the girl who was going to be my wife, I said, I think I'm going to move to New York and move in with you, and then I'm going to stay home and try to write. She said to me, oh, that's a wonderful idea. She said, let's do that. Who could resist that? You don't have to be an American to write the great American novel. You don't have to be an American to write, uh, to, to be the curator of the great American museum. You can, anybody can do that. The only thing I don't like about curatorial imagery is that it seems to be applied to things that are already there. Whereas for me, literature is a, is, a, is a lively negotiation with the ongoing. I don't know the difference between being 68 and 28. So I don't know the difference between sitting down to write a story now from sitting down and writing a story when I was 28. It seems the same. But I just think that young writers have to be readers. And they, have to, and they have to know that they're doing when they sit down at their desk every morning at age 25 with no experience and no hope for success. They have to realize that they're doing what Chekhov did. Because that's what Chekhov did when he was 25, when he became Chekhov. So you have to think to yourself, there's no difference between what I'm doing and what Hardy did, or what Chekhov did, or what George Eliot did, or what New Hampson did. It's all the same. It's all, no matter how pokey and local it is, it's all shooting for the stars.